it's been so great to hear all the different talks and to see things that are mentioned in the previous talks, you know, that I was also going to mention as well. So I'm going to try to tie things together as much as I can. And um, yeah, so we, we've talked, um, I remember Sherman Chu gave an awesome talk where he was talking about people, technology, and processes. I'm really going to be telling my story through the lens of the technology, um, specifically this thing called Synapse, uh, which is which is pretty cool. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Um, and, and so, yeah, let's move on. The, the first thing I want to mention, and hopefully this will uh, um, give me some credibility, is that I've been working with Synapse since about 2017. Um, so definitely a big fan. I think uh, some of the teams I've been on have been some of the first users. Um, I work for a company called ExtraHop, which does network security. And we, um, we're setting up a new intelligence team. And so from my perspective, when you're doing intelligence, uh, the, one of the first things you need to think about is your database. Um, the job of intelligence oftentimes is relating the old to the new. Um, if you have something that's entirely new you've never seen before, um, oftentimes the, um, the intelligence finding is, hey, this is brand new. We haven't seen it before. Or if you find something that you've seen a million times, um, that also isn't particularly interesting, um, but we're kind of at that edge of expanding the knowledge, taking something that maybe wasn't known before, um, discovering it, and then eventually um, what we have what we found is that uh, it, it's, it's pretty well known. So when you're going to do this, you want to have the best database possible. Um, and, and really, I was trying to think if I was forced to do intelligence without uh, this database to back me, could I do it anymore? Because I've incorporated the the thoughts and the data schema so much into my my thinking that it might be challenging for me to to back out and not use this. Um, and, and so I'm going to um, do a little bit of introduction about the platform for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, I'm going to talk about the database considerations again. Um, when you are doing threat intelligence, um, what you know as a company is very important. Um, and I'm gonna talk about maybe how many databases you're gonna set up, how they're gonna relate to each other and where Synapse fits into that whole process. Um, I'm gonna talk about the data schema, um, which again is something that we've, we've touched on in several talks. Um, I'm actually a big fan of Jira as well. I've used Jira for storing intelligence um, for, uh, for this, but you know, the, the Synapse database is gonna be at the more technical level. You're gonna be keeping track of IOCs, um, domains, IPs, files, file hashes, strings, things like that. Um, we're also gonna talk about analyst workflows. So when you're talking about the people, processes, and technology, you have to think about how the people, processes, and technology all work together. Um, and I'm gonna show how that works with Synapse. And then I'm gonna show uh, basically how you document this. And this is the idea of um, making sure that everybody's on the same page. I'm actually a huge proponent, proponent of documentation and how it can help you. And then finally, what do the outputs look like from uh, a technical system like this? I, I think that um, I, I wanna be very clear, like I'm a, I'm a sample of one. I can share my six years of experience using this tool. Um, other teams are gonna have different uses for it. And so, um, at the same time, I think that six years of experience um, is going to give me some insights that maybe um, you can all benefit from, because I know this is a tool that's growing a lot, and so I really want to um, help the new, the new generation, <clears throat> excuse me, the new generation who is adopting this tool, because I know it's actually growing in popularity quite a bit. Um, so when you're thinking about your database for your Intel team, um, most of us work for companies that are 100, if not 1,000 you know, or more people. How do you all stay on the same page, right? Um, one of your analysts, you spend them a lot of time to be smart and they come up with a finding and you want to say, you know, across your company, you want to take advantage of, of that insight and that analysis and that knowledge. So if you have 100 people in your company, how do you, or, or 1,000 or more, how do you keep everybody on the same page? Um, and something like Synapse, a technical database, is great. Um, you can say, pick an IP address that might be of interest. Maybe it's an IP address that just came out in a prominent uh, blog or, or something and you have questions across the company. 
you can make this your single source of truth. Everybody across your company can have the same visibility and the same understanding as your smartest intelligence analyst. And I, th I think that's huge. I think, um, especially when you have multi-function multi, multi, multi teams, you might have some uh, SOC analysts, you might have some incident responders. You really wanna have the same, the same view of the world, right? And again, taking advantage of the smart analysis that you've done, um, this is a way that you can, again, keep, keep everybody on the same page. Um, another, another thing I really like about this particular technology is that the, the data model matches the real world. Uh, I, think, I think sometimes computers are so complicated and you know, we have a lot of things that we need to keep track of, but they do have a physics to them. Certain things talk to each other in a certain way. Um, you know, certain, certain things happen repeatedly. Um, you can think of how, how DNS, IPs, uh, and domains all relate to each other. That stays kind of the same, and it's really nice to have a data model that you can just go to that matches that real world, because then if you know how computers work, you kind of know how the data model works as well, because they go so closely together. Um, also, something that maybe we don't um, think about, but we definitely should, is the idea that you have evidence and you have analysis, and those are not the same thing. And so when you're keeping track of them, you want to keep track of them um, in, in different ways and, and make sure that it's very clear and allow it so that you could revisit your assessment. Maybe you do make a mistake. Um, I think a lot of us don't like to think about that if we make a mistake, but um, what if you make a mistake and you want to back back out and redo your analysis? Can you separate the two? Can you separate what you know from what you assessed um, in, in a very clear way? Also, um, one thing that uh, I really enjoyed was the Bletchley Park talk where they were talking about the index files that you have, these index files that keep track of everything and allow them to do lookups. I mean, I think that you can almost draw a line from the Bletchley Park index files to this technology because it's the same thing. Like they had a te uh, technology, like maybe there was a weapon system that they wanted to look up in their files. And so they had these indexes that would allow them to do that. Um, this is the same kind of thing. Like we have complicated questions that we're going to ask of our databases and we um computers are complicated right so that makes our questions complicated it's not always going to be straightforward it's not always going to be a keyword search i think most platforms support a keyword search but um can you do pivots and filters and a whole bunch of complicated stuff along the way to get um, answers to your most complicated questions i'm going to show an example on the next slide um just to give people an idea of what that can look like um, made by analysts for analysts, you just feel kind of in your happy place when you're an analyst working um, with this technology because you can tell that they were really thinking of you. Um, and I really appreciate that. And I, I, I think it really comes through with the technology. Um, performance and scalable. Um, a lot of technologies, when you're trying to keep track of indicators, do one-to-one -one relationships. And um, has anybody ever run into the 127.0.0.1 problem when you're dealing with a database like that? Um, you, can, you can really start to um, have to make what I would say are, are compromises when you, when you model things um, in, in certain technologies. But uh, Synapse, um, again, I don't want to get too much under the, under the hood, but the hypergraph technology allows you to, um, allows you to what, what I would say is, again, model things in a real world way that makes sense, that allows you to pivot um, in amazing ways. Um, also, I think a lot of people um, have a lot of different vendors, right? You might have, um, call it five vendors. And when you're doing data analysis, you know, you don't first of all, you don't wanna to go to five different uh, platforms to look up the same IP address or the same domain. You want to um, really like, if, I, if I'm asking about an IP address, I just want to ask about that IP address. I don't want to have to ask the same question five different times. Um, and, and, and also because um, you can integrate your vendor tools with, with this technology, um, things like metrics become really awesome. You can actually see how often am I using the data from the different vendors. And then you can start to do a vendor assessment um, as far as how often you're actually going to use that data to create intelligence products which is a big fan, which I'm a big fan of. I like metrics. Um, and so this is just one example. Um, 
I don't know about anybody in here, but if, if you've used a technology where you have to like right click on something on an indicator to look up more information and you can you have to do that for maybe 10 different indicators. Um, I love the fact that you can do many to many pivots, meaning show me all the IP addresses that I've attributed to a particular group. Um, then I want to pivot across all those DNS records to perhaps a different, you know, a set of domains. Um, also, you can do what, what are called subquery filters, which is something where you can basically say, I wanna look for nodes that are connected via some sort of an edge to, to other nodes, or I want to remove things that are connected via an edge to other nodes. So you could say, I'm looking for DNS records, but I just don't wanna see the ones that are connected to, to trivial indicators like 127.0.0.1 or maybe 8.8.8.8. Um, so I, I just put one example up here. Um, I don't wanna go over it too much, but um, you know, let's say I want to start with this domain that might be in a domain of interest, and then I want to pivot to all the DNS records, um, specifically the DNS array records. But then I'm I'm coming in in the morning. I only want to look at one day's worth of data, so I'm going to filter that down to just the previous day between one day ago and now. Go to the IP addresses, and then remove all the ones that I've already found are associated with the threat group that I'm researching, which in this case is APD28 because I already know about those, I'm looking for something new. And then basically I wanna to go to passive total and pull in new records. Um, the syntax may look a little scary, but um, number one, if you use it a lot, it becomes very second nature. Also, um, you can create macros. So for common tasks, and you don't wanna to have to keep typing things repeatedly, um, you can shorten it. And also that helps the, uh, the new users to get over the learning curve. And, and so again, um, because uh, I think I have some unique experiences as far as setting up this technology, um, I just wanna share some lessons learned as far as like what it actually looks like to deploy this technology at your company. Um, and, and again, also feel free to hit me up with uh, more detailed questions. Cause I think probably a lot of people are gonna be in similar situations if you're trying to set up a technology like this. And um, also I'm just very happy, you know, to, to help. Um, and, it's, and it's also worth mentioning, which um, Katie also mentioned at the beginning, there's there's two versions. There's an open source version, which is available on GitHub, and there's an enterprise version that you can buy. Um, if you buy the enterprise version, it will save you development time, um, and it will also help smooth that user experience. Um, but for the talk, I'm going to be talking about the open source. Okay, so you're all set. You're going to, you've made the commitment, and you've decided that you're going to move forward with Synapse. Um, one of the first things to think about is where is your data? Um, it's gonna be somewhere right now. And um, if you're like a lot of people, it's gonna be in S3, it might be in a Postgres, it might be in Dynamo, it might be in Snowflake. Um, one of the first questions is what do you bring into Synapse? Um, I like to think of Synapse, the, the technology as it's like the surface of your desk. It is not like the filing cabinet that you have next to your desk. Um, when you are, an analyst, you're looking at specific things um, in the course of your day, and you're not gonna be looking at everything in your filing cabinet. You're gonna be having an active workspace in front of you um, that you're working with. And so, you know, one of the questions is, what, what do you bring in? Um, and, and one of the first questions is, how much data do you have? Um, I realize that that's a vague question, and, and depending on your organization, um, you might view big differently, but um, one, one data source I've used in the past is the virus total feed, which is massive. We're talking a million or 2 million rows a day of data. Um, do you actually want to bring that into your active workspace? And again, keep in mind that you have your filing cabinet and you have your desk in front of you. Um, throughout the course of the day, you're only going to be looking at a finite number of IPs or domains or, or other, other indicators. Um, and, and so really, the, the question is, can you leave it where it is? Maybe it's going to be a lot easier for you to set up an integration between whatever your intelligence platform is, um, whether, whether it's Synapse or another platform. And, and perhaps if you can create an integration, you can um, leave it where it is and then only bring in information that's related to what you're actively working on or your active investigation. Um, something to keep in mind there, though, is, you know, again, um, how quickly are you going to need it? Um, I kind of like 
have a uh, a thought with with certain technologies um, where if you knew what you needed yesterday, like if you know what you're going to need today and you knew that yesterday, maybe you could use a certain technology um, to store the data. But if your analysts are going to be forming real time enrichments from another database, they need um, something that's going to return, you know, I would say 30 seconds to a minute, right? If they can't be waiting there for 30 minutes for their query to return. So how quickly are they going to need it? Is it something that's going to be blocking their active investigation, blocking their workflow? Um, if it is, then maybe you need it in something like Snowflake that's going to respond much more, much more quickly than something like Athena. And like I said, if you did know yesterday what your analyst might be working on today, then um, maybe you can do some pre-enrichments along the way. You can do some pre-lookups. Um, essentially bring in the data from uh, yesterday's alerts and have it all ready to go in the morning. That's kind of how we do it at our company is we know that we're gonna be looking at the alerts from the previous day. So you can actually say, okay, I'm just gonna bring in all of the, the relevant enrichments for the set of data that I know I'm gonna be working on tomorrow. Um, for those of you who have ever looked at the Synapse documentation, um, there's something like 400 different node types, um, which is awesome in the sense that whatever type of intelligence work you're gonna be doing, the data model is probably gonna support it. Um, but I think that gets really overwhelming. And if you're like me and you go to the Cheesecake Factory and you see that menu and you're leafing through the, <laughs> and you're leafing through the entire menu, like I, I love a restaurant that has like 10 items, you know, give me like your 10 best items. I'm gonna pick one of those. Um, and, and I think with, with Synapse, you have to think of the same thing. Like on the screen here, I have an organization node a log event, which is essentially think of that as like an alert or a detection, um, some IPs, some domains, and then um, some outside enrichment information. I mean, that's really not that overwhelming, right? And so you can start there. All the other options are still available to you. They're not, you're not closing off any paths by simplifying. You're just really gonna focus on your use case and what's most important for you at that time. Um, and, and that's that's kind of how I tell people to, to get introduced to the platform is, to start start simple and and like I said, um, what, whatever you end up doing, whether it's going to be host analysis or whether you're going to be, be doing more network analysis, they've got you covered um, within the data model. So you can you can then at that point um, you know decide where you're going to go. Um, and, and actually, I'm going to call, do a callback to Chris Sanders' talk at the very beginning um, because he was talking about the most efficient investigative paths. And that was really cool because at the end of the day, you're trying to save your analyst time. There's so much data to look at every day. And you really um, you really don't want them to have to do anything um, manually twice. You can do something manually once and say, okay, you know, that's like, that happens. If you have to do something manually two times, at, at that point, you want to start thinking about how do we automate this? How do we speed this up? How do we make it so that our analysts can, can move really fast? Um, I mentioned macros. Um, sometimes you have a workflow that you do repeatedly, and it might be fairly complicated. I, I take a lot of those and I make them into a short macro. It, it reduces a command down to maybe 20 characters, and then I don't have to, you know, repeat repeat that every single time. Um, and, and really, you want your analysts to have all the obstacles and hurdles cleared out of their way um, so that they can just focus on what their value added aspect is, which is going to be that that analyst component. Um, and so this, this tool is not just a database. It also has essentially an automation engine built in. So you can say, I'm going to set up some crons for some things that I need to happen at certain times. If you're like me and you have a fairly limited virus total quota, um, I'm going to, at the end of the day, set up a cron job to use up all my quota at the end of the day, um, so that I get the most value from my, uh, my spend. Also, you have things like indicator um, specific enrichments. When an IP address is added, maybe you want to do a passive lookup or a passive DNS lookup, or maybe when a domain is added, you want to um, try to pull in, uh, you know, what files might be connecting to that domain. There's, there's, the sky is the limit, and it's really going to come down to your use cases. But um, again, if because of the platform and it, and and also. If, if you think about the difference between your developer's time and your analyst's time, 
a lot of times your analysts don't want to have to fill out requests for development time. Um, if they can just create an automation in the system themselves, uh, that's going to that's going to be very efficient for them. So the things on the screen are things where analysts can kind of take the control into their own hands and not have to fill out a development request, you know, the Jira ticket with justifications, things like that. You, 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 you really empower the analysts by giving them these, these automation engine capabilities uh, themselves. Um, when you when you think about the knowledge of your organization and, and all staying on the same page, you have to essentially um, make sure that when one person in your organization says something and another person in the organization says something that they're speaking the same language. Um, if your company attributes a specific indicator to a threat group or a specific malware family, making sure that it's, it's gonna be very clear um, through everybody working on the system, what exactly that means, what the confidence level might be, um, what, what the language used is. So um, I mentioned that there's a data model within Synapse and it's very, um, it's very robust, but it actually does not come with a tagging structure. You have to make that your own. So you have to come up with a tagging structure. You can borrow the one that uh, the company, the Vertex Project uses who writes the software, or you can come up with your own tagging structure. And this is where as an intelligence team, um, and we've talked about this uh, throughout the past couple of days, is you have requirements, you have outputs, you have people who are asking you for um, answers to specific questions. That's gonna drive what your tagging structure looks like. Um, data mappings, this is like one of the absolute best things about Synapse. Um, I think a lot of the best CTI analysts that I've known are very, very um, focused on normalizing the different data sources. And so if you have um, an IP address in one database and another database and another database, normalizing that so that they all look the same when you bring them into your, your platform, your, your database. And so um, every single time we bring in a new data source into Synapse, we um, do a data mapping. It's on a wiki internally so that we can make sure that um, everything is mapped appropriately and normalized appropriately. Um, and duplicates get merged. And this is how you get to that one node um, for one indicator concept where, again, if I'm asking a question about a specific IP address, I want to see my answer in one place, not in 10 different entries. Um, and then also another thing we do um, is just we, we use um, Git for keeping track of all the different automations that we have created within the, within the tool. They're self-documented within the tool and you can have them there, but also just for um, version control and for communication amongst different people on the team, we find it useful to have the code just laid out there and tracking, tracking changes and things like that. And then finally, output. This is gonna be driven by your use case. Um, like I mentioned before, I'm going through a day's worth of alerts and looking and seeing what I can find. Um, I find it's useful to output um, a lot of the relevant data to a CSV and then once I find something of interest, I go back into the platform to perform further investigation. Um, but you know, your use case might vary. Um, also, again, if you if you buy the enterprise version, you can smooth your experience because of their user interface and um, some of the the um, tools they have for outputting the data. Also, um, if you're supporting some sort of SOC or IR function, you could think about a, a chat bot who can essentially plug into your Synapse instance and respond back with a really smart answer on whatever's being asked. Um, and, and again, I, I love this picture. It's one of my favorite pictures. And I really view you know, um, Synapse as being right in the middle of, the, of this uh, data information intelligence process. You're, you're normalizing it, you're processing it, and you're gonna make it very exploitable. Um, I, I feel like once you do a lot of this prep work to get the system modeled or to get your data modeled in the system, um, then it allows you as an analyst to move really fast, like I said. Um, so in summary, uh, I've covered a lot of ground and I'm, I really want to emphasize that please do come up and ask questions because I think um, different organizations that find themselves in the position where they're trying to get going for the first time. Um, you might have a lot of questions about how do you consider setting up your databases and, and integrations and gestions? Um, how do you set up your schema? How do you set up those analyst workflows? What does that actually look like? Um, 
And then I talked about documentation, which um, if you know me, that's just something I love to talk about, but I don't know if everyone wants to hear me talk about it. And, and then thinking about what your outputs from the system are gonna be. Um, I wanna thank, uh, again, everybody for listening. Thank you for the other speakers who have provided some really awesome uh, relate, you know, related information to what I talked about. I love how this field ties together. Um, and we keep talking about related things. Hopefully um, you found this, this technology piece interesting. And uh, yeah, thanks a ton.